All right, we have a, need to have a board meeting a few minutes after service this morning. I want two things. Uh, meet the trustees for about, oh, about 15 minutes after service this morning. If you have a Bible today, let's turn to two places, one place in the Old Testament, one place in the New. And in the Old Testament, we're in Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 8, Romans chapter 16. In Proverbs chapter 8, we'll begin at verse 6. Proverbs 8, begin at verse 6. And then uh, Romans chapter 16. We're just going to take uh, one verse out of here. And we'll take uh, 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 Romans chapter 16, verse 19. Now, many years ago, when I went to uh, Bob Jones, I had pretty good fellowship with uh, old man Bob. I say that respectfully, not uh, derogatorily. We call the captain of a rifle company the old man. And the Navy, the, ad the admiral should run the ship, he's called the old man. I, I mean that respectfully. But old man Bob used to write me some letters. One of those letters he wrote me, he said, uh, he said, Petey said, uh, it's good sometimes just to give people milk and not strong meat all the time. He said, sometimes you get too strong meat and too much strong meat get indigestion. But he said, you can always drink milk or even skim milk. And he said, you'll find that a lot of people won't follow you in the strong emphasis you give. That's what he prophesied in 1951. And I didn't understand exactly what it meant at the time. I didn't see why I was putting any strong emphasis on nothing. But what he was talking about is my strong emphasis on Bible doctrine, see. And he, he had it right. And so occasionally I just uh, preach a little bit of milk. And this morning I got you a good milky sermon. This kind of thing that Oliver Green would preach or, uh, or Harry Ironsides. And uh, there's not a, nothing complicated about this message. But I want to talk to you a while this morning about the simplicity of salvation. I had Romans chapter 16, first of all. Romans chapter 16, verse 19. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, in your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. When it comes to evil, evil, don't, you don't have to get too complex. If you know it's wrong, quit it. If you know it's wrong, turn away from it. Uh... You don't have to know anything about rattlesnakes and all that hurts you. You'll just get away from them. All right, Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 6. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination in my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain. They are all plain to him that understands and right to them that find knowledge. I call your attention to the first few words in verse 9. They are all plain to him that understands. Nothing could be plainer than salvation. Now, Father, we ask your blessing upon the message this morning. We pray especially for the unsaved people that are here, if any are here, any boys or girls, any men or women who are still alone in the world without hope and without God. And I pray whether they know their condition or not, they'll see their condition this morning. May they understand how simple this thing is, how easy it is. And I pray you give assurance to these who have doubts about the salvation. May they not try to make it complicated. But may the Holy Spirit bear witness that the truth we're about to preach from your word. And I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Now I'm going to talk about the simplicity of salvation. I'm going to say, first of all, God made it easy because of love. Love doesn't make things difficult for the one that's loved. Love makes it as easy as, easy as possible. God doesn't wish for any of his creation to be separated from him. God is not anxious to, to get rid of you eternally. Uh, the Bible said that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. That means it's not prepared for man. That means God don't want you there. If you go to hell, you go on your own. And love made it easy for you to get out of there. And love wouldn't make it difficult. It's easy because of love. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. We love him because he first loved us. God so loved the world. It's all through there over and over again. Uh, if you love somebody, you have compassion upon him. You're concerned about him. One of the reasons why Jack Kyle has been as successful as he has in his work is he has compassion for people. He does. He really does. Whatever faults he may have, a liar between him and his master is none of my business. But I know his, I know his best points. His best points are certainly not preaching or teaching. 
his best point is people, people. He tells about one time there, he, some little girl had been bused to church for about two years, came up to him. She came a family of about six little kids, and their daddy didn't make peanuts. And she always came to church with her shoelace untied and her hair all messed up and dirt on her. But she is a little girl got saved, came to, down the poor end of town. And one day after they'd been coming to church for about a year, two years, she came up to him with a little rag doll in her arms, and she said, uh, Preacher, we can't come here no more because we've got to leave. Mom and Daddy leaving town. We've got to go with them. He said, well, I'm sorry to hear about that. And she said, I, I don't think you understand what I said. We ain't going to get to come to church no more. I ain't going to get to see you no more, and you ain't get, going to sit to see me no more. And he said, well, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what I can do about it. And she said, well, ain't you going to cry? <laughs> she said, you're going to cry, ain't you? See? Now, you read your Bible that when Jesus wept over Jerusalem, and it's there, you know there's love present, and love makes the thing just easy as can. It don't make it difficult on purpose. Now, if it has to be difficult, okay, but not on purpose. Not on purpose. God doesn't wish to get rid of the creation, so he made it easy because of love. He made it easy because of his commandments. If God is faithful to his own commandments and his own standard, he showed his mind on this thing many times. He showed his mind to married people. When married people have trouble, he said, be kind, tender-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake. See, it's, a, it's, 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 it's rooted in God. As Christ's sake have forgiven you. Now, if God would give that commandment to a human sinner, don't you know he'd follow his own orders? You think God would sin against his own instructions to you? If he told you, uh, forgive him 70 times 7, my brother sinned against me, shall I forgive him 7 times? 70 times 7. You think he'd tell you that and not do it himself? He'd be obligated to keep his own standards. God showed his mind in a case of an estranged wife or an estranged husband getting messed up. He showed his own mind about those things by he said, if they come back to you and say, forgive me, forgive them. Then he'll do it for you. It's so simple. He made it simple because of his teachings. He taught a parable about a woman who lost a coin, a woman and a man lost a sheep, and one, boy, one man lost a son. And he went out and looked till he found them. Woman looked till she found the coin, man looked till he found the sheep, and the daddy waited till the boy came back to him. Down there in Mexico in 1985, there was an earthquake down there, 7.8 the Richter scale, and uh, that thing that went down through there, I think there were something like uh, 7,000 people that died in that thing, got killed. They had 10,000 searchers out trying to find children that were caught in the rubble there. And when well, they got the thing down to where they were missing one child, and they had something like 8,000 people still searching for that one child in the rubble. They called the National Guard out to try to find those children buried in the rubble of, that, of Mexico City, and that thing hit. Uh, 8,000 men out just looking for a couple of lost children. If man would do that, don't you know that God would do it? Don't you know God would do it? The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The Bible said that prodigal came home when he was yet a great way off. His father saw him and ran, had compassion, and fell upon his neck and kissed him. Why, why do you think it's so hard to get saved? Well, you make it hard. I mean, you got out of your seat this morning and start down that aisle to receive Jesus Christ, I'll tell somebody to beat you there. It'd be God. God beat you that order. You say, how can God beat me to that altar? He's back. If he's back here in the farthest confines of the universe making galaxies and nebula, don't you worry about that. When he was a great way off, he saw him and ran and ran and compassion and fell upon his neck and kissed him. God made it easy. It's easy to be saved. How long did it take to uh, keep uh, Peter from drowning? Peter's out there drowning and he's going down. And he says, Lord, save me. How long did it take him to save him? People, oh, God, save me. Oh, God, save me. Oh, I'm going to hell. Oh, save me. Next year, oh, God, please save me. Oh, God, save me. Oh, God, save me. I'm lost only next year. Oh, God, save me. Lord, am I saved? I want to be saved. Come on now. He's out there in the water. Lord, save me. Just like that. I used to be a lifeguard, among other things. And uh, they always told us uh, when we go out to get this guy, come up behind him, get him by the hair. They get panicky. The fellow gets flying around there in the water, or a woman or a man, you get up there, grapple you, and go under, and both of you drown. So what you do is you come up, you go underneath, dive into the water, come up behind him, and grab that hair like that, and turn around and pull him off by the hair. And that way, it isn't a cruel thing. It's a way of getting them saved. 
But can't you imagine coming out, somebody dying out there, and they're flop, 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 taking water two or three times, screaming, come up there and say, uh, say, uh, 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 what do you believe about the virgin birth? <laughs> you know, which church did Christ found? Do you believe in eternal security? What do you think about the baptism? <laughs> baptism of the Holy Ghost? You talk in tongues? <laughs> God doesn't do that to people. When God Almighty wants to save a sinner, he don't put you on the mat to find out how much you know about the book. Right. People get the funny ass idea. If I got an old ruck that knows about the book, I'll never get saved. You don't have to know nothing I know about the book to get saved. All you got to know is you're a sinner and going to hell and don't want to go. Amen. That's all you got to know. All you got to know is you're drowning. Yeah. I'm not going to come out there and say, what's the third head on the beast? Or what's the little horn in Daniel? Or where did Cain get his wife? You know, that kind of stuff. Nonsense. God Almighty makes God God Almighty illustrates his desire to save you by when a fellow says, Lord, save me, he saves him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, why why does it look so complicated? Man makes it complicated. Man makes it complicated because of sin. I mean, he he just he does it deliberately. All this religious stuff. All this religious stuff, getting all these religions together. I mean, right now in the school, they're teaching kids Hindu meditation, yogi. In the schools, public schools, after saying there should be a separation between church and state. Then you put one in. Sit cross-legged and try to imagine this stuff, you know, and project yourself and all this junk. That stuff is oriental religions. You want all Hinduism will do for you? Go over and live in India. But you're a madman. I mean, I know, I know pilgrims in Kashmir that take a journey way up there in the ice and snow and go back in there for a week at a time, nearly starving the way, to get up there and worship a phatic symbol in the form of a stalagmite, a frozen thing hanging down over a lake up in there. Man makes it difficult. Why, if you're going to get saved by those oriental religions, how many of you could really meditate long enough to get out of the frame, huh? Why you take Buddhism? Why Buddhism? Not one, not one Buddhist out of a, a thousand attain samadhi or nirvana. They don't. I've been with the Japanese. The Japanese sit around and talk to me about it. I'd get around. I, I was a music officer for Radio Tokyo. My job was handling the music broadcasts. We get out in Katsu or Nikko or some place and get about ten miles from an SP or an MP any place. And I'd sit there in the uh, hibachi, you know, and put your feet down under the blankets, you know, and eat the sake and drink the sake and eat the stuff, you know. And I'd get talking about Beethoven and Brahms and Japanese music, and about that time my interpreter would turn to one of the men there, and I'll trip on something and say something, they'd turn around to me and he'd say, a lieutenant, they say, no talk music, talk Buddha. Talk Buddha, talk Buddha. They knew I'd attain something that some of them had been working all their life to attain, and I'm attaining yet. You better thank God Buddhism is in the way of salvation. I mean, you're going, you're going to get, you folks going to have enough discipline to sit cross-legged in front of on a bamboo mat for two hours at a time and project out of your frame without drugs? <laughs> How many even capable of it? I don't know. What a, what a, talking about a narrow way of salvation, boy. That's really a narrow way. <laughs> All this stuff. How are you going to get rid of your karma? Men make it complicated. Man, it's, you know, flip the bees. Hail Mary, full of grapes. Blessed be the fruit of the loom, you know. I father struck down, how be an can come with a light the candles, you know. Blow out the candles. Spin the prayer wheel. Light the incense. Pray up down the street. Tire the wafer. Get up and get down. Put on a sackcloth. Whip yourself down the street. Crawl around your knees. That isn't salvation. That's man making a mess out of something. If Jesus Christ loved you enough to die for you, he's going to tell you the way you get to heaven is crawl up your knees on a step till your knees are bloody. If he, if, he, if he loved you enough to do what he did for you, that isn't true. Men complicated. They look to feelings. You look to feeling, you'll get killed sometimes. Fell up there in a storm flying by instruments, the fellow says, go by your instruments, go by your instruments. Well, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm fly, you're flying upside down, man. You're flying upside down. Look at your panel. <laughs> the guy can think he's flying right up when he's flying upside down. He think he's flying west when he's going east. He think he's gaining altitude when he's falling. You can't go by your feelings. You have to go by instruments and the thing like that. All this stuff. Why, if you went just by your feelings, you'd think that, that Europe was the most holy place in the world. Boy, you want a aesthetic culture, man? All this stuff with Bob Jones, you know, and all this. Well, that's, that's kid stuff. You ought to go to a Neuschwanstein in, in Germany or Fürsen 
or Kemze, or you ought to go to those big old cathedrals in Etal, those uh, Catholic cathedrals. You ought to go in there, boy. Man, you talk about painting. Everything painted with oil paints, boy, and gilt gold leaf all over the place in there. And then on Sunday afternoon, in comes a little quartet, string quartet, and plays some Mozart. You walk in there, you talk about impressed, boy. Talk about feeling, man. About art, you know, culture. You can walk in those buildings, just feel a presence in there. <laughs> but in the Lord, it isn't the Lord. It's, it's awesome, but it isn't the Lord. Men make it complicated by inventing their own standards and own values. They got their own way. Well, I think if you do this and do that and do this. Well, I believe if you do, I believe you do that. I believe if you do this. I believe you don't do that. Don't tell me that fellow say if he does this. And don't you tell me anybody say, yeah, but, uh, I was preaching over there at a penitentiary over there in, in, uh, in Tallahassee a couple of months back. And right there, an old black boy down there in the front looked like he might have been an ex-preacher or something. Sit there and he says, well, I want to ask you a question, uh, Dr. Ruckman. Do you mean to tell me if a man preaches the gospel and believes that book and then he goes out and gets on drugs and stays on drugs and gets in the drug traffic and then commits adultery and fornication, uh, do you mean to tell me he didn't lose it? You know, that's the impression all those prisoners talk about of the salvation. That kind of stuff. Men do that. Men do that. They do that to the... The first place, the first place, a fellow like that, if he really did that, if he was saved, he might have been saved. God probably kill him. He wouldn't be in the jail. <laughs> he probably did. And if he wasn't dead, then he'd be dead shortly thereafter. But you don't have time to go on those kind of things. Men do that to try to impress you, to try to talk you out of these things. You mean to tell me a fellow can do it? Listen, listen, brethren, I'll, I'll be saved. I'll be saved 46 years coming up. This next year, 46 years, and the 46 years I've been in the ministry, I have come to the conclusion that any Christian with the right opportunity and the right temptation and the right motive and the right feeling could do anything that an unsaved man could do. That's my judgment on it. I haven't drawn that judgment until 46 years, almost half a century, man. Don't tell me I'm prejudiced. Don't say I just made that thing up. I've had time to look around. To all the standard. What you mean is that terrible sin is the one that you wouldn't do. That's what you mean. I know how the people are. The fellow goes down there, he's going to be a police officer. Back in the old days, you had to be six feet tall to be a police officer. And had to be some kind of physical condition. The guy comes down, they get up there, and the thing comes over his head, and it's five feet, 11 and a half. Stocking feet. Next guy comes in, five feet, six. They put both of them out. They wash both of them out. They go out the door, and the guy, five feet, Six says, ha, ha, you didn't get in. The fellow five feet, 11 and a half says, yeah, but I almost made it. The short guy says, yeah, but you didn't. Yeah. Well, I came close to you, did you, midget? You never came anywhere near it. Yeah, you didn't make it either, though. Yeah, but I came with a half an inch. Yeah, but you didn't make it. <laughs> Let me tell you something, brethren. There's only one religion. There's one religion in this world that demands sinless perfection. And it isn't Buddhism, it isn't Hinduism, it isn't Taoism, it isn't Mohammedism. No religion demands sinless perfection as a key to heaven except biblical Christianity. It's the only one. All the rest of them have low standards. If you just do this and do this, you know what that book says? That book says if you do the whole cotton picking thing, you wind flat in your back in hell. You know what that book demands for you to get to heaven? Absolute perfect sinlessness. You say, I can't make it. I, I gathered you'd think that. <laughs> you know who made it for you? Okay. You see how simple that thing is? All God demands is perfect sinless perfection. That's all he demands. And since you can't do it, he's given it to you. All religions have inferior standards. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, had not submitted themselves in the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness of one of the believers. No religion is set up that way. Every one of them is man saying, if you do this and do this and do this, don't do this. And do this and don't do this, you might make it. That book says, if you do this and this and this and this, don't do this and this and do this and this, you go to hell like a bullet. That book says, since you can't do this and can't do this and should do this and don't do it and did that and shouldn't do it, I'm going to send you somebody who did the whole thing and you take him or else. Amen. It's simple. 
It's simple. Men argue about the scripture. I think some men think that uh, they're counting on the mistakes that God made right in the Bible to get them to heaven. And they have some men are trusting the ignorance of the scripture to get to heaven. I talk to people down south. They think just because they're ignorant of the Bible, that's going to be their safeguard. They're counting on their ignorance to get them by. <laughs> Arguing about scripture. You know, I've seen unsaved people sit around and argue about whether you can lose it or whether you can't lose it. If you're lost, you haven't got it to lose anyway, brother. <laughs> Scripture, scripture, you take the scriptures, argue about the scriptures. Scriptures won't do you any good unless you meet the one who wrote the scriptures. Scriptures infuriate women, liberals, criminals, perverts, atheists. And folks say, what, what, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? What do you believe about the other thing? What do you believe about baptism? What's your, Ruckman, what's your position on baptism? My position is this. <laughs> That's my position. <laughs> what's your position in hell? You don't have to go there. They want to get in an argument. And they think if they win an argument, it's going to keep them out of hell or get them to heaven or be as good as what you got. It ain't going to do you any good arguing about scriptures. Those scriptures get folks upset. Why, did you know these people like these atheists and communists and women, women liberals and, and perverts, these people, they get a verse of scripture upset them when it don't even deal with them. Do you know that? You put a sign in front of your house saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And atheists just come apart. You yeah, haven't attacked his religion at all. Put a sign out in front of your house saying, My God supply your needs, the riches of Christ Jesus. Some sex pervert come down there and tear down the sign down. There's something out of that book that just aggravates and irritates people, just stirs them up. We had a young fellow here who got, got arrested and given a ticket for something the other day. I was trying to get him on a on a, a tag on his car, which he had in the front instead of the back because he came from Texas. And that police officer got out there right away and said, Are oh, you fellas getting ready to kill all them doctors? Because he had a scripture on the on the on the car, the scripture in the car had nothing to do with killing doctors. Might have been John three sixteen. That word of God has power, boy, and it tears them up, meets them up, gets them arguing, spitting, fussing, fighting. They think that's going to you know take care. Of, get argued about it, and prove a point. Think that's going to take care of some, and you won't take care of anything. Now, how easy does God make it? Let's get down to basics. How easy is salvation? Well, God gives similitudes in that Bible, and here's the first one. It's as easy as taking a glass of water. Whosoever, whoever is a thirst, let him come to the water of life. Take the water of life freely. Go out that door, there's a drinking fountain right out there outside that door. You get saved just easy, go out that door and bend over there and turn that thing on and get you a drink. Isn't that easy? It's so easy. You know what's so difficult about salvation? It's realizing that you need it. I always make it just difficult for a fellow to be saved as possible. Up to the invitation. The invitation, I make it just as easy as possible. The most difficult thing about salvation is realizing you can't save yourself. And once you got there, the rest is like falling off a log. But boy, try to convince them of that. Like taking a glass of water. I was in a home one time up in Bay Manette. A fellow was unsaved and his wife. We talked about stuff and scripture and stuff for 30, 40 minutes. And there are friends of mine up there. His name is Curly Hollinger. Took me over to meet him. And we sat around there and talked a while and didn't get anywhere. And finally he said, well, I just don't know what to do to get saved. I said, well, I've been talking a good while. <clears throat> I'm kind of thirsty, which I wasn't. But I said, would you get me a glass of ice water? And I didn't get a glass of ice water and brought it back in. I said, thank you and took it and drank it and handed it back to him. I said, just like that. He said, what just like that? I said, salvation. I asked you for the water. Did you give it to me? He said, yes. I said, did I take it? He said, yes. The gift of God is eternal life. You want it? And the guy said, yes. I said, okay, take it. <laughs> and he got on his knees and got saved. It's like that. Is he's taking a glass of water. He says, as good news is for a, from a, as good news is from a far country, uh, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Uh, when a man really gets down, right to ready to die, he wants, all he wants is air. <laughs> and after that, the next thing he needs is water, and he can live longer without food than he can with water. Water is essential for staying alive. Uh, JFK, one time back about April or May of 1961, uh, decided he'd invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. And you never saw such an operation in your life. You talk about a bunged up military operation, that was one. And when that thing was all over, there were 22 men on a 20-foot boat cast ashore there, cast out in that gulf, floating around, trying to get away from Cuba. And only one on that boat had any kind of experience. 
they soaked in water all day long but couldn't drink it. Some of the fellows decided to drink it. After a couple of days, they couldn't stay anymore. And they drank a little bit, and pretty soon green pus came out of their eyes. They began to scream. A bunch of them died in terrible pain. A seagull landed on the mast, and they bat that seagull, bat his brains out with an oar, and divided him into 20, 20 pieces for the 20 were left. A shark followed the boat after about a week, and they killed it with a flashlight and an oar. At night, they got the flashlight to get the shark up to the boat and then banged his head in with an oar and lived off him for a while. But after about three weeks, it began to rain, and they got the guys standing there with their mouths open like that, getting the rainwater in their mouth. He said it was worse afterward. They were becalmed for 24 hours. They drifted by land and couldn't swim to it. They began to hold each other's hands, and they died before they pushed them off the boat. Every one of them lost 30 to 40 pounds. They had blisters and balls all over them. The guy in charge of that boat twice jumped over because there wasn't enough room in the boat. He felt bad, guilty conscience about being the leader, jumped over twice, and they had to haul him back on board. They had five dead in 17 days. They finally picked him up uh, 118 miles south of New Orleans in that boat floating around there. All the time I've been out there. Floating around water, 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 water. Whoever's a thirst, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Freely. Amen. You want it, you take it. So it's like receiving a gift. Matter of fact, it's so easy like receiving a gift, the Bible calls it a free gift in Romans chapter 5. One time many years ago, a relative of mine up in Alabama gave me a watch for Christmas. I'd just been saved about a year and said I was called to preach, and he gave me one of these big engineer watches, you know, where the chain goes down your pocket. And he said, I thought I'd give you a watch for Christmas. He said, Pete, he said, uh, every preacher ought to know when to quit preaching. <laughs> you know, ha, 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 you know. I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I said, that's pretty good, Pop. He said, let me, let me ask you something. I said, I bet you sure get mad if I didn't take this, wouldn't you? Boy, and he got red in the face and said, well, no, I wouldn't get mad. And I said, I'm going to take it. But I said, suppose I wouldn't take this gift. You give me this watch. Wouldn't kind of upset you? No, he's about to blow a top right on the, on the spot. And I've got it right next to me. I said, I said, how do you think God feels when you turn down the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? That old farmer stood there and looked at me a minute, just turned around and ran out of the room, ran, ran, back in the bedroom, slammed the door. It's easy to receive a gift. Now, when you get something, there's a number of ways you can get it. You can earn it, or you can steal it, or you can beg it, or you can borrow it, or you can inherit it, or you can take it as a free gift. And salvation, you cannot earn it, you can't steal it, you weren't told to beg for it, you don't borrow it because it's permanent, and you don't inherit it, it don't come automatically, so there's only one way left, you take it as a free gift. What's it easy as? It's easy as putting money in the bank. Here's a, I got on the bank, I said, the bank says, I'm gonna repossess you a land. How come? Well, you default in this mortgage here, you owe us $20,000. Isn't it here by 10 o'clock in the morning? Why, well, you lose it. Well, about afternoon, I get a telephone call in the bank. Said, there's a fellow down here that says, uh, made out a check to you for $20,000. And he said, all you got to do is come by and pick a thing up, and you can pay the thing. All you got to do is pick it up. He's down here waiting for you. And I said, well, I believe a fellow ought to earn his own way, and I've always been earning my own way. And the way I look after the best a fellow can do, I'm a fool if I don't go down and pick it up and pay it. It's there. And when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, he shed enough blood to save every cotton picking the sinner in the face of this earth. The debt has been paid. What you got to do is go down and pick up the check. That dumb Calvin said he shed just enough blood to take care of a limited number. I thought he was God. If he was God and omnipresent, you know, and omniscient, you know, and om omnipotent, he wouldn't have enough to go around. Somebody come out short, the checks are all down there. You're told to go down and get it. It's that easy. What's, what's salvation like? It's easy as answering an invitation. You get an invitation, come to dinner tonight at 6 o'clock. All right, you'll be there, you won't. That's all there is to it. I'm told when you get an invitation from a king or a queen to come to a banquet or a meeting, you cannot turn it down. You're supposed to accept it. 
And if you don't, you've offended his royal highness or highnesses or whatever her name is. And if you turn him down, you've done something wrong, you're obligated to take the invitation. You got an invitation from the king of kings and lord of lords to attend a banquet and come home to a marriage supper. All you have to do is answer the invitation. That's why they give invitations. We ask you to come down here and kneel. You don't have to do that to be saved. But that's an invitation, you see. It's inviting you to do something by what you heard. You can be saved by standing back there right as like that, just in your heart receive the gift. You can be saved just like that. But we're given an invitation. And that invitation comes from a king. And it says, if you confess me before men, I'll, I'll confess you up there. That's an invitation. And old Jack Hiles used to preach out in Texas. He had an old boy out there named uh, Carmen Hartsfield, who was a you know, Hispanic about uh, 18 years old, thought he was called to preach. And Saturday afternoon, he and, he and another Hispanic named Cortez were cleaning up the church out there, and Hartsfield decided he'd preach an evangelistic message about 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon. So Hartsfield got up in the pulpit to preach to this one man, Cortez, at the back, in a church seat of about 300 people. And Hartsfield got preaching. Every couple of minutes, Cortez would say, Amen. Amen. Amen, preacher. Amen. Amen. Big empty building. Just <laughs> two of them there. And there was a guy coming home from football practice. Well, about uh, 90 years old, coming to hear that thing in there, hear that, amen, amen, Saturday afternoon, around 5 o'clock. And he came up and stood in the back there, walked in there and stood in the door, and here was a strange sight, this preacher up in this pulpit, <laughs> banging and slamming this one guy in the back, amen, 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 amen. And that football player stood back there for about 30 minutes, and when Hartsfield gave the invitation, he went right down there and got his knees and got saved. Amen. Got an invitation. What's, uh, what's salvation like? It's like taking a bath. Like taking a bath. It's like wash and be clean. How much more do you say if they wash and be clean? Uh, you take, I'm not much on baths. I think soap uh, produces cancer. I've always thought that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I don't, I don't know why. The, I mean, they used to bathe Saturday night, I think. Something like that. You know, once a week. And, you know, you refined, cultivated folks. You civilized folks. And not like Ruckman. You can't imagine that. Somebody bathed him one day a week. Oh, my God. You know. Phew, you know. <laughs> I wonder about some of you. What would you have done back in 1870, 1880, 1890? I wonder about you. You in a Conestoga wagon going across there with a family and no way to get any water and the water being rationed? I bet you you wouldn't have your right guard and your left guard and all that stuff with you. Back in the old days, folks must have stunk or something. But you take, I learned how to appreciate a cold shower in a hot tub while I was in OCS and CMTC, military camp. You've been down there in Fort Benning, Georgia, in 105, 106 in the, sh in the shade, boy, for a couple of weeks, man, that red Georgia clay, and there's nothing like that red Georgia clay, boy, about August or July. And man, you come up that March, boy, that cold shower sure felt good, boy. It sure felt good. I've come many a time from jogging here in coming off the pavement or five hours work out there in the yard in July or August, and I've got a pool in my backyard. Ain't much of a pool. It's a wading pool about that deep, you know, or maybe eight feet long, four feet wide. When I get through working out there four or five hours, I'll just, I won't take off my clothes. Man, that's too much trouble. Just go over and flop in it, man. Just go and kick off barefoot. You don't have to kick off your shoe. Just go over and flop down in it. That feels so good. <laughs> Salvation feels so good. It's a great to get clean, boy, and get the old fire of the hell quenched on it. It don't burn and blister your skin, boy. It's like an invitation. Finally, it's like this. Salvation is easy as letting somebody in the front door. I know that passage in Revelation doctrinally is not referring to salvation, but it's a beautiful type. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come and supper with him with me. It's a beautiful type because Christ said uh, he's like somebody that enters a man's house. And if he enters a man the house, he will take the strong man, the devil, and pitch him out and take over the house. And if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. you got to come in this old body and get the, make it the temple of the Holy Ghost instead of the unholy ghost. He said, he that receiveth you, receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, receive him that sent me. Holman, Holman had a painting one time on Christ at the door. You've probably seen it, Christ knocking. That's a famous painting. And Holman's painting of Christ knocking at the door. He has at nighttime, he has the Lord standing up there with a lantern knocking at the door of this guy's house. It's all overgrown with weeds and vines and things. 
and there's no doorknob uh, on the outside of the door. And the fellow asked Holman, why is that? He said, it has to be open from the inside. The old I stand at the door and knock. He's not going to break down the door. Come inside. I was in a talk to a fellow one time in this town about his soul, a fellow about 45 years old. I went by his house and knocked the door, and he knew who I was right away. And he, we talked about, it, about a couple minutes at the door, and he said, uh, I asked if I'd come in and talk to him a while. He said, uh, not about that salvation bunk. And I said, well, just a couple of minutes. He said, no, I don't care if that church bunk, that salvation bunk, you leave that outside. If you're going to talk about that, stay outside. I said, well, I was going to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And he said, well, I don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. I said, in that case, I'm not coming in. Your house is yours. Good day, sir. I wouldn't, put a, I wouldn't want to put a foot across your door cell. And I'm in it. Christ said, if you receive the one that I send, you receive me. I'm not going to any house where a fellow says, before I come in, don't you talk about Jesus Christ, you come in here. I'll stay outside. I'll stay outside if it's 15 below zero, brother. If my Savior isn't welcome, I'm not welcome. Did you ever ask him in? Come in the door. The fellow named Reverend J.C. Barnes, a great preacher from the early 1900s, that got up in the Northwest one time and he got lost in the mountains and half rose and unconscious. His horse carried him to a cabin and he fell out of the saddle unconscious. When he came to, he came to by a fire there and a man had heard the horse outside and gone out and hauled him out of the snow and brought him in there and laying upon him and wrapped blankets around the two of them until he warmed up and then got him by the fire to warm up some more. And that fellow turned out to be an outlaw. His name was Jake Woods. That fellow had sworn never to let a preacher or a lawman into his house alive. And when that thing, when he finally came to, that preacher did, and saw where he was, what he was dealing with, he was scared to death, but he was praying about it. And he said, well, Jake, he said, uh, I want to give you some money for saving my life. You saved my life, I want to give you some money. He said, if I'd known you are a preacher, I'd let you die out there in the, in the snow. If I'd known you are a preacher, I'd let you froze to death. And he said, well, could I do something? He said, uh, I'm well enough to go now, and if I know where I am. You show me where I need to go from here. Civilization wasn't far away. He said, I'll, I'll go. Would you let me read Luke 15 before I go? And Jake said, go ahead. And that preacher read Luke 15. There was a certain man that had two sons. The younger said, Father, give me the portion of good that falleth unto me. And so he divided them his living. And not many days after, the younger gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his son with the righteous living. When he'd spent all the rose of mighty family in that land and began to be in want, he went and joined us all down through there. Got the bottom of that thing. My son was lost and was found. He's dead and alive again. And then he prayed. And he bowed his head and prayed. When he prayed, he got down there and said, uh, Lord, he said, uh, Thank you for old Jake Woods doing what he did for me and taking me in. He said, uh, he invited me in, Lord. He invited me in, Lord. Help Jake Woods to invite you in like he invited me in. Amen. And he looked up. That old outlaw was standing this way, looking out the door, that way. The sunlight up now, temperature rose about 20 degrees, bright sun out through the snow, and Jake was just standing out like that. And suddenly he said, Come in. <laughs> come on in. <laughs> Just asking the Lord to come in. <laughs> Got saved. He borrowed a Bible. About three weeks later, J.C. Barnes got a meeting in the schoolhouse about five miles from that cabin. And invited a bunch of men to hear the gospel. And old Jake Woods came there to the meeting and invited 20 men to come with him, lumberjacks. And got up in front of him with a Bible in his hand. And Jake did. And told him what God had done for him. And three of them got saved. And old Jake Wood said, he said, come in, come in. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do it. That's the simplicity of salvation. Let's stand for prayer. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we want to thank you for Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation. It's so simple a child can understand it. We're thankful it wasn't some uh, big, tough, complicated thing like we worked at for years and years. Lord, how many years I remember hunting and searching and seeking and trying and testing all these things and coming to nowhere. And a lot of the people uh, didn't have high school education getting in the door I wasn't getting into. And the people out there just simply trusting you and relying on you that uh, they couldn't have an IQ of 90 and, and you took them long before you took me. I want to thank the simplicity of salvation. Anybody can be saved. And I pray this morning if anybody here is unsaved, they'll get saved today as we tarry in prayer.
Now let's carry in prayer a few minutes while the musicians play. And before I ask for a show of hands, you look down that heart of yours and just ask yourself this question. Have I ever come to Jesus Christ as a sinner, as a sinner, needing salvation, and asked him to save me? And if you did, he did not turn you down. Him that comes to me on no wise cast out. Whether you believe it, whether you have assurance, whether you know it or not, if you came to Christ a sinner and asked him to save you, he saved you right on the spot. But you've got to come as a sinner. Now let me ask you something. Is there a sinner here this morning? Is there a sinner here this morning who has never received Christ as your Savior? Is there a sinner here this morning and you have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Would you raise your hand and let me pray for you? Would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you. Anywhere in the building. You know you're a sinner, but as far as you know, you have never asked Jesus Christ to save your soul. Would you raise a hand? All right, one more. If the sinner here this morning, you know you're a sinner, and you asked Christ to save you, but you don't think he did. You asked him to save you, but you have your doubts about it. Although you did ask him, would you raise your hand anywhere in the building, if that's your case? Or raise your hand anywhere in the building. All right, thank you. Thank you back there. Any others? Any others? You knew you were a sinner. You came to the sinner. You asked him to save you, but you don't think the job was done. You're not sure about it. Would you raise the hand? Anybody else like that here this morning? A man come the altar, the one that's coming for salvation or just for assurance. But maybe somebody else should come. Now you raise your hands and said you were you asked Christ to save you. You don't know you're saved or not. I'm gonna pray for you. Then we're gonna tag just a few minutes. And if you don't have assurance about it, don't know about it, I want to ask you to come forward and let Brother Don have a word of prayer with you and take you back to the office and show you something in the scripture so you can leave here this morning with assurance. Father, we pray for this one that raised his hands, said he received Christ, he's come to you and he's asked you to save him, he doesn't know he's saved. We know this often happens for all kinds of reasons. We know the devil will work a fellow over after he gets saved, get him a doubt. We know Heavenly Father, if a young Christian doesn't spend time in the Word and spend time in the service, he can, he can have doubts. We pray if this person is saved, they'll get assurance about it this morning. If they're not saved, you'll save them right now on the spot. We pray if the first time they asked you to save them, it wasn't clear in their mind. They didn't realize their true condition or what you could do for them. But they realize it now. We pray, Father, that you might uh, make it real to them right now. Our right, heads bowed and eyes closed. Anybody else like to come? Come ahead. We're going to tire just about two minutes and we're going to close. If you have your doubts about salvation, Brother Donovan is down here at the front to meet you. My associate pastor, he'd be glad to go back in the prayer room, have a word of prayer with you. Give you some assurance from the Word of God. If you come, come on. If you're having doubts about it, if you don't have any doubts about it, all right, if you do, come on right now. All right, Father, bless the Word of God. May these people that leave this building this morning be saved, people in the body of Christ, by the grace of God, with assurance of salvation. And thank you for the simplicity of salvation that made available to every one of them free. And thank you for the great work you did for us we couldn't earn. Thank you for salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.